Hello, I'm Earl Weinberg, and this is Book Circle Presents The Cavalry Cycle. We've been following our lads as they get used to their new forms and the new lives that go with them. But they aren't the only ones who have to get used to the new forms. What happens when they go home for Christmas? How do their families get used to the new them? Cold Yule, Buckjack, what we go on with. John stepped out of the horse trailer and looked around. Still no cars. Beyond the edge of the road was a patch of scrub forest. Past that lay the outermost edge of Sturk, then the rest of Sturk, and then the sea. It was winter, the leaves were down, and you could see a long way into the wood. Level rays from the early sunset drove almost all the way to the houses. His friends handed duffels out to him. He started hitching them to his harness. The driver came out and helped, which was polite but unnecessary. After all, he'd taken classes in exactly this sort of thing. All set, pony boy? she asked. He wasn't sure she knew his name. Yes, thanks. Happy Christmas, then, she turned back to the lorry. Happy Christmas, jockey girl. He did not know her name either. Happy Christmas, Buck Jack, called his mates, shutting the horse trailer door on themselves. See you next year. Next stop, Linstow, the driver called. The lorry roared away. To business. John pulled out the special camo t-shirt, then stripped off his jacket and undershirt and stuffed them in the remaining backpack. He paused for a moment, bare under the bright white overcast, and wondered what would happen if he neglected to put on the camo and a car drove by. Perhaps it would kick up a spray of snow at just the right moment. Perhaps everyone in the car would be arguing about where to stop for supper, distracted. But it might be something more drastic, like, what the bloody hell is that? Followed by a car crash with no survivors. Best not to find out. He slipped on the camo shirt. A buckskin horse under a saddle blanket and a load of packs stepped into the forest. It was an odd sight, certainly, but in no way supernatural, paranormal, or magical. And the horse seemed to know what it was about. Anyway, there was no one to see. The bit of forest was called the Oakwood by the people on Oakwood Street just beyond, but to John it was just the woods and a feature of his life since he had grown up on Oakwood Street. A more constant feature than almost any other, he reflected. Certainly more constant than himself. There was a skittering noise in the branches as of a squirrel, but it was not a squirrel. It dropped straight out of the trees, landing in the snow at his forefeet and looked up at him. It looked like a skinny woman, middle-aged in appearance, about the size of a small cat. She wore dark furs, probably mole, and a festive winter cape of red squirrel with a train of tails. He had seen her occasionally all his life, but never knew her name. A lot of them were chary of giving out even use names. Return and we return, he said politely. Keep faith and so do we, she rattled back quickly. Returned but not unchanged, she added. He wondered what she saw, the horse or him, or both. Thought you lot wore cowboy hats, she said, surveying him with solid black eyes that were too large for human proportion, but quite typical of an animal that size. Yes, ma'am, we do, he replied. It was hanging on his backpack. He reached back, fished round, found it, and put it on. Here. She laughed like branches creaking. Now it's got holes for the horse's ears. It did not really. Good shirt. Happy Christmas. And she was up a tree. Happy Christmas, he returned in roughly the right direction and walked on. A few minutes later, Valerie Weldon looked out her kitchen window and saw a horse in the backyard just emerging from the woods as shown by the tracks in the snow. It was a buckskin, creamy brown with brown-black legs, mane, and tail, bearing bags and packs. It wore a Stetson with neat holes cut for the ears. She shivered, braced herself, and stepped out the door. John, she asked of the horse. Hello, Mum, it replied in John's voice almost John's voice. There was that new tone to it, a deep ringing note under the familiar voice. Just a minute. The horse tossed its head to one side, flipping off the hat, which it caught in its mouth and lay down on the snow. Then it twisted its neck and a backpack fell off, apparently out of its mane. Finally, it seemed to be trying to bite its own neck. There was a rippling like hot air over a summer road and there was John. 
he stood bare to the waist, holding a t-shirt in his hands. Below the waist, he was still, and would forever be, a buckskin horse. Excuse me, he said, bending over the backpack in the snow. What was that dark stripe down his spine? He pulled an undershirt out of the pack and put it on. Then he donned a red-brown jacket, but seemed in no hurry with it. He must no longer feel cold the way a, a human would. Valerie Weldon felt her stomach knot. She wanted reinforcements and remembered she had them. Dominic, she called into the house. Dom, John's here. Outside, John saw an upstairs window open and his father lean out. He blinked. John's dad had been slowly balding as long as John could remember. He had been wondering how far it would have progressed. His interest was not merely academic. If he had inherited these genes from his father, not even his transformation would save him, though hair restorer might. But the actual degree of balding could not be observed now because his father had shaved his head. He had also grown a heavy mustache. Dad, your hair! John, your legs, his father returned. Just a minute, I'll be right down. John picked up hat and pack and moved to the kitchen door. His parents came out to him in boots. Feet not cold, his father asked, looking down at his hooves. John smiled. Not really. Ever see a horse in galoshes? No, come to think of it. Leg warmers, yes. John's father was a trader, doing import-export in both Le Mans Major and Le Mans Minor, often taking his family with him when he judged it safe. He had a thorough, unhurried way of looking goods over, his assessing eye, John privately called it. He was running it over John now. His mother had been present the day he was transformed, but his father had been away on a trip, so this was the first time he had seen his son in the new shape, in person. John took the opportunity to look his dad over. He was by no means short, a little under six feet, but now John towered over him, being near seven. Somehow he had not expected that. He remembered, though, looking down at his mother from his new height, minutes after the transformation. He remembered her tears, with something like horror behind them. Now, months later, her eyes still registered some sadness. His father's gave away no mood, another trader's talent. Phone pictures just don't convey it, he said finally. By St. Nick, don't you look like Jeff, though. St. Nicholas was his father's favorite saint, being patron of sailors, merchants, and children, all three areas that touched on his life. They both look so much like you now, Don, his mother proclaimed, with a brightness that was a touch artificial, and of course ignoring the thousand pounds of horse flesh each brother now incorporated. His father chuckled and ran that assessing eye along John's barrel and over his legs. Is that good or bad, he asked her. In answer, she kissed him on the side of his shaven head. John relaxed slightly. He realized a bit of tension had left the muscles where man's back became horse's neck, as if he were no longer holding himself together quite as anxiously. I like your new look, Dad, he offered, hoping to hear, I like your new look, too. A quick smile. Got tired of always restocking Restorer. Oh, well. Is Jeff here yet? Not till tomorrow morning, his father answered, but Chloe and her family are here. Chloe was John's sister. They must be out shopping or visiting, or he'd have heard the children. Peter comes home tomorrow evening. Peter was his younger brother, away at St. Ambrose, a boarding school for the Sundered. Oh, John, said his mother, show your dad the shirt. John held up the camo t-shirt. It was white, with a few almost calligraphic lines and a faint wash on the front in fawn, making a semi-abstract portrait of a horse head, a buckskin. Dom Weldon took the shirt, ran the assessing eye over it, felt of it, and even seemed to listen to it. Good material, hand-drawn, not printed. Heavy enchantment, complicated. What's it do, glamour? Yes, sir. A paternal eyebrow raised at the reflex, sir. I wore it through the woods. You can see a long way in from the highway in winter, and anyway, I wanted to try it out. Show him, his mother urged. That meant disrobing again. As he obeyed, he reflected how being naked meant nothing at all to him back at the base, but made him feel distinctly uncomfortable in front of his own parents. Odd, when you considered he was, in literal terms, always naked from the waist down now. Still, it was perhaps nice that they were taking an interest in his life in the cavalry. 
He donned the shirt, then picked up his hat and put it on. They laughed at the way the horse appeared to flip the hat onto its head, where the brim developed holes for the ears. He then put the backpack on so that the horse appeared to pick it up with its teeth and tuck it invisibly into its mane like an equine stage magician. Then off with the pack and the hat and the t-shirt and on with the undershirt again. While he changed, John told his father the price, which included repair service and insurance. His father nodded. Very good value, he said. Much of the trade he ran was in enchanted items. The cavalry subsidizes it. Custom made? Yes, sir. A smaller eyebrow lift. There are a couple of glamorists at Uffham that can do camo and disguise work for the cavalry. Anyone there do seemings? Seemings fooled touch and space as well as sight and sound. You could fit an elephant in a briefcase with the right seeming. But such were orders of magnitude rarer and more expensive. More often, they were got by trading big favors. No, sir, not that I've heard. Such things might well be kept secret. Could you save up and get a belt or pants that let you seem human? The tension returned to his gut. He found his feet were dancing in place, and he stilled them deliberately. No, sir, it wouldn't work. People have tried, but the spell doesn't cast or fails easily. There are belts for mermen, his father persisted, that let them look human and walk land, and Scandinavian mermaids have skirts they wear to go ashore. I know, sir, no one knows why this is such a stubborn transformation. Yes, blindly copied from enemy mages back in World War II. Which was a deed of dubious merit, the tone implied, or was John being too sensitive? If we find them again, John offered, maybe we'll learn how to control the transformation better. Meantime, I'd still rather be half horse. He felt the sentence floating visibly above his head like a cartoon balloon. His father gave an exasperated sigh that John had learned to dread before he could talk and said, yes, we'll hope. So much for liking the new look. Where shall I put my bags, he asked. We've got the garage set up for you and Jeff, his mother said, like last year, though last year only Jeff had stayed in the garage. It looked much as it had last year, with only two gym mats and only with two gym mats instead of one, both provided with pillows and unnecessary quilts and blankets. There was a floor lamp, a small TV, and a pair of desk lamps on the counter of the shop area, made more study-like by the addition of a tablecloth. Personal effects, such as books and DVDs, had been brought down from his old room and Jeff's. He resolved to squeeze up there and see his former bedroom while he was here. There was, of course, no reason why it should still be a bedroom, unless it was a guest room. And there's a pair of space heaters, his mother pointed out, if you need them. We should be fine, Mum, unless there's a bad cold snap, John answered her. We hold heat more now. That line of argument had not worked for Jeff, and John did not expect it to work for him. As on the previous Christmas, there would be a silent battle, his mother turning the space heaters on every time she came into the garage, Jeff, and now him, turning them off later. Thanks, it has everything our stalls have, he began unloading himself. His father stepped forward to help, then stopped not wanting to interfere or not wanting to touch his transformed son. Instead, he conversed. They can't seem to decide. They put you in stalls like horses, but the stalls are in barracks for soldiers. John dropped a duffel on the bed mat and spread his arms, indicating his new body. Ambiguity is the name of the game, Dad. We are men and horses both at once. That's what Captain Fletcher says. Jeff tells me Captain Elaine says we have two natures now. We've grown horsehood, grandi en chevalité, and can't leave it behind any more than our legs. According to Jeff, Captain Elaine actually used a variety of anatomical comparisons. It is your legs, said his father. Exactly, but the stalls are really more like dorm rooms, his mother sighed. I'll get some tea on, she said. As she, as she left, she turned on the space heater. His father stayed and made a pretense of helping unpack, but clearly he was there to talk. You're happy with your choice? I know, I know, it's too late anyway, but I need to know how it is with you. John felt his eyes prick. He blinked it away. Big, fierce warrior stallions shouldn't cry in front of their fathers. I am happy, Dad, yes, no regrets. But then he sighed and sat on the bed mat, rump down but four legs still up, and braced. 
He leaned over and braced his arms on his foreleg knees. He'd barely thought about this shift of posture, but half his mind noticed that his father seemed disconcerted. It's a little complicated, he admitted. His father stared at his equine body as if thinking his pose was where the complication lay, but nodded for him to go ahead. I was very unhappy, of course, when Donna turned me down. It sounded like a lie. He should have said desperately, not very, but that would sound like a lie, too. He knew. He had tried saying it in private. Nothing from so far inside could come out and still sound true. I'm still... I'm still unhappy? That felt like a lie as he formed the words, but this time because he wasn't sure it was true. I'm still not happy about it, there, but it's better for joining the cavalry. Not felt good, but better, less bad. His father said nothing, but nodded again for him to go on. His face was a stony blank, as it was whenever Donna came up, ever since her refusal. That new mustache made it even harder to read. It was so simple at first, John went on. I wanted what you and Mum have, to marry and go traveling with my wife and later my kids. But Donna ended that. His father started to say something, but stopped. So I concentrated on the travel part. Dad, the places they go. They're still mapping out the road to the sun. They think the Brendan Reach and the Yggdrasil Reach might connect. Have you read about the traveling gate, the Halflands, the Genesis Partition? There are dozens of places they haven't even named yet, just numbers on passage maps. This earth is like a grain of sand in an oyster, and there's pearl all around it. His father nodded, and a gleam of wanderlust passed through his eyes, but he said, but the standard cavalry, the infantry, the navy, they all go there too, all of you together. Why transform? Unconsciously, John stood and stared out the window in the garage door. He did not know he loomed or see his father take a small step back. Because I have a taste for the strange, Dad, inherited it. He was still staring out the window and did not see the flicker of answering hunger in his father's eyes. But he cast his own eyes down to the floor now and added, and because it closed the book on a story with a sad ending. He glanced at his father's face and saw it stony again. But his words, after a pause, were said gently. Jeff changed. His personality, I mean. He isn't easygoing the way he was. There's a new sharpness, energy, too, which I, is good, I guess. But I have to wonder, have you changed? We can't really tell from phone calls and emails. And John knew guiltily there had not been many of those. Oh, yes, he admitted, but I don't know how much is from the spell and how much would have happened if I'd joined Standard or the Infantry. His father waited, wanting more details. John remembered his eyes pricking. I cry easily now, he thought. I jump at surprises. I blush. I pop off when I'm mad if I'm not careful. Darnley, Charlie Horse, says it's the same for him. But he says he feels things more now, and I know he means he feels more alive. Well, good for him. But I don't feel things more, as far as I can tell. I just can't keep them in easily. Do I tell Dad that? It's different for everyone, he said. You know horsepower, Rennie Wardley, the big one? Yes, he's a draft horse. The change made him calmer. Draft horses are like that. For me, for you, said his father after a bit. Well, I can't be objective, can I? Probably a lot like Jeff. Energy. But I'm not moping. His father nodded pensively. Everybody changes as they grow up, Dad, he offered. His father glared at him. Grow up? You grew sideways, grew a horse, grew away. Why did you have to stop being human? Because I was no good at it. The stony face was back, but it looked eroded, and there were pinpricks of wet in his father's eyes. Maybe, John thought, he was less transformed than he thought. Maybe Rennie was calmer because he wasn't worried about dying now. Maybe he himself was more emotional because of what had happened before the transformation. Maybe he had inherited more character traits from his father than a taste for the strange. That's not true his father said, gentle voice from the stone face again. 
We never thought that. Maybe other people thought that, not us. After a little silence, John said, like one making an offer, I still am human. I'm just a horse, too. His father nodded. Of course, human. What other creatures would fret and argue like this? And for the first time since the transformation, his father touched him, reached out, and hugged him. His father then held him by the shoulders at arm's length and looked him up and down. Strong, brave man. Then he reached down and clapped John on an equine shoulder, and a fine horse, if I'm any judge. He was not. Dominic Weldon traded in many things, but not horses. Not that this was the point. So that's what we go on with. Thank you, Dad. Uh, why do you say I'm brave? Because you went to the cavalry and said, shoot me in the chest and change me forever, then send me to work for you out on the edge of creation for 14 years. We can argue about whether that was sensible or not, but it certainly took nerve. John felt himself blushing. Thank you. The exasperated sigh came back. Why did you think you were a failure as a human being just because in the nick of time, or had she been listening, his mother opened the door to, to the house and announced, tea. And we'll follow John, also known as Buck Jack, next time. <laughs>